I have always wanted to be a teacher, and I have been a teacher for uh, at least 30 years in different capacities. And I knew that when I was in college, I knew I wanted to go for my PhD and work in higher education. I also knew I wanted to be in ministry, and so I see both of them together, uh, uh, working together. I, uh, how did I wind up here is a wonderful story, actually. Uh, my mentor uh, said to me at one point when I was living in Seattle, she said, you should start looking for positions, and you're close to being done, so start looking. And so I literally got out my laptop and I typed into Google my dream job and the University of Dubuque Seminary popped up. And I had one week to fill out the application and I got it in and it was wonderful because I was, I was an adjunct professor at the time, I was working on staff at a church, I was happy there, um, but I also knew that this was where I, I would want to be ultimately and so I was ecstatic when I got to be here. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about the brain and building habits of character. By the end of this lecture you will have basic information about how the brain works, how it learns, how it builds habits, and also some challenges about learning and building those good habits. And the information that's in this lecture can be used to help you study better, it can be help, help you to learn more successfully, or it could be used to help support your own spiritual practices. So let's get started. So I would like for you to close your eyes, and don't worry, nobody's looking. Close your eyes and imagine going into your kitchen. And imagine looking on your counter and seeing a lemon. And I want you to go up to that lemon, and I want you to cut that lemon open and then I would like for you to pick it up and smell it. And now I want you to take a bite of that lemon. What happened for you as you imagined that happening? Most likely what happened is you felt your salivary glands work a little bit more. You might even, some of us might even have been able to smell the lemon or we might have puckered a bit at the expected tartness of the lemon. What's so amazing about our brain is that it has a powerful ability to imagine. It can make real something that isn't here. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in this lecture. But just hold that in your mind. There are no lemons present. Yet for just a moment, you might have experienced the presence of a lemon in your memory. Here is a diagram of the human brain, just basic systems. All human brains have the same basic system, but no two human brains are identical. Because the moment you start learning something, our brains change. Different pathways are formed in different people based on their experiences and their wiring of their brain. Habits of character begin with how a brain builds these memories, these skills, and these habits. In order for the brain to learn and grow and build habits of character, it needs some things to function, some very basic things. It needs food, it needs water, and it needs oxygen. So you see these questions. Think about this. How long can a human go without food? Well, actually, it's going to be pretty painful after a few days. And for some people, they can't even go a few hours due to underlying medical conditions. How long without water? Again, there's a very short period of time that a person could not have water. And how long without oxygen? That one we know that less than five minutes and the brain can be damaged or a person can die without oxygen. These are vital for life. So I'd like for you to take a deep breath. Imagine these trees right now that you're seeing. They're giving out oxygen. I take, invite you to take a deep breath. Right now, that oxygen is going to your brain and providing vital, life-giving energy to the functioning of your brain. This is one of the reasons why exercise is so important. 
It's good for us, and one of the reasons it's good for us is that it helps our bodies have an efficient system and get oxygen to the places it needs to go, especially to the brain. One study in John Medina's book, Brain Rules, says that in 12 weeks of exercise, brain function increased 90% in 27-year-olds, but once they stopped exercising, their brain function dropped. Another thing we need after oxygen is food, good food. So paying attention to good nutrient guidelines and the advice of your own medical professional, find good food to feed your brain. And then the third thing we need is to stand up and stretch and to move our bodies, to get some of that oxygen in and flowing into the brain. You'll feel more attentive. So if you're needing a sense of attention, have a piece of fruit, stretch, or drink a glass of water. All human brains have the same basic systems. But as I said, we start learning and making new memories and new experiences from the moment we're born. So if you know who Harry Potter is, you have a Harry Potter neuron. If you don't know who Harry Potter is, you don't have a Harry Potter neuron, and that is perfectly okay. If you know when I hold my hand up like this, what this represents, you have a Mr. Spock neuron and live long and prosper, and you probably grew up watching Star Trek. It's okay if you don't have that neuron, but what that lets you know is that your understandings, your memories actually have a physical place in your brain. You have a neuron or a cluster of neurons that hold that information, whether it's a Harry Potter neuron or it's a Mr. Spock neuron, or now you know what an astrometric binary is. So you now have that neuron. A neuron fires, and when it fires, if it fires strongly enough, it fires with those neurons around it and creates a cluster. And over time and rehearsal, these neurons become linked together and they form a memory. The first experience with the material is the most important. And then retrieval or rehearsal of that material, walking that path over and over again back to that initial memory and hanging on new information as you learn it, that's what creates learning. The more ways that you can rehearse the memory, the more different inputs that you can put on that memory, whatever you're learning, whatever you're experiencing, will help you retrieve that memory. So I'd like for you to think of it as a door with door handles. Now we know of a door just with one door handle, but in this case, I want you to think of a door with multiple door handles. So if you're reading something for class and you're thinking about uh, learning this information, the first input is the text on the page. And then it's going to be maybe some pictures that are with the text, maybe some graphics or maybe some art. Maybe you're also listening to some music that's helping you focus as you're studying. All of these inputs are going into you learning this particular bit of information. The more door handles, more inputs, the more sensory inputs you can put on this information, the better you're going to have uh, retrieving that information when you need it. So imagine one of those door handles, as I said, would be the text. Another one would be the art or the graphics, the visuals, the sound. If you could figure out how to smell it, you would have it made because smell is one of the most powerful memory makers that we have. Now, in an effort to keep us attentive, I would like for you to stand up. You can keep watching, but you can stand up and get some of that oxygen moving and that blood flowing to your brain. There is a diversity of, of uh, student backgrounds ages. I had in one of my classes, I had a 22-year-old and I had an 84-year-old. So 
to have that kind of diversity and we were talking about generational theory. So it was perfect because then I had represented right in front of me all of the generations that we were talking about and we could talk about the different, uh, the different aspects right in that class. I love that. Um, I, I experienced that a lot in the seminary because there are first career and second career, even third career students going into ministry. Uh, I think all of the students bring a desire to learn. Uh, I, all the students need support in how to learn a new field if they have not studied theology in the past or ministry in the past. So it's again going back to those tools. What are some of the basic educational tools that I can use to help them? Uh, I love the fact that University of Dubuque invests in the undergraduate students, that they provide what's necessary to help them succeed, which I know is not the case in a lot of universities. And that is something that um, also attracted me to this, this institution. Here are some challenges that we face when we're making memories or building these habits of character. We're gonna talk about four of them. Task surfing, distractions, stress, and lack of sleep. So, task surfing. We often use the word multitasking, but that is not what the brain is doing. The brain actually cannot do two high-level functions at the same time. It shifts between one function to the other function, and then it shifts back. It actually has to put to sleep the neurons that are attached to the one activity in order to wake up the neurons that are atta attached to the other activity. And every time there's that kind of shift, we lose time and energy. Small amounts, but we still lose time and energy. Trying to read a book, trying to text someone, and trying to watch a movie at the same time, three high-level functions, trying to do them at the same time, will mean that we're not actually going deep on any one of them. We're simply task surfing along the top. So what's the challenge here then? Why do we do it? Because actually, it can be kind of fun to multitask and do a whole bunch of things all at once, have a whole bunch of windows open all at once. The brain likes novelty. It's one of the good aspects of the brain. It likes to learn new things, and it's constantly scanning the environment to see new things, to experience new inputs, and to gather new data. The challenge is that there is many things in our culture that want to capitalize on that love of novelty. It's exciting, but over time, that kind of shifting and task surfing will do some less desirable things to our ability to make memories. First, it overworks our working memory, our short-term memory. So it makes it harder. We get more tired when we're trying to learn something. It also makes it very difficult to make long-term memory. If you're constantly moving from path to path to path, no path ever really gets concrete laid down. And then the other thing is we get practiced into a habit of distraction. There's another piece of this, and that is our working memory is the size of a cup, and our long-term memory is the size of a bathtub. Now that's great, because that means the long-term memory has plenty of space for anything that we want to put in it. We can learn so many different things, and the brain is made for that. But the cup, we have to put it in the cup first, and anything that flows over the edges of the cup, if it's too much, will not make it into the bathtub. How might this affect us? Each person is going to be different. As I said, each brain is different based on our experiences and how our different formations. But here's some thoughts about it. The first is that life-giving habits can be more difficult to form. Long-term memories are more difficult to form, so relationships can lack the depth because they depend on that long-term narrative, that long-term story. We actually might not remember the stories of the people around us or pay deep attention to those stories. And we may not pay attention to our own stories. 
we might be so focused on all these different tasks that we are shifting back and forth that we don't take the time to think about the story we want to be writing and that God wants to write through us for the life and love of the world. One of our distractions, and there are many good things about technology, but one of our distractions is the smartphone. Here is a photo by Eric Pickerskill. He did an entire series where he took photos of people with smartphones in their hands while they were with other people. And then he took out the smartphone to show them just being apart and not communicating with the people they were with. What habits are being formed that you see in these photos? Here's some statistics, and this is from Adam Alter's book, Irresistible, talking about technology addiction. In 2008, the year that the iPhone came out, the average person looked at it 18 minutes. In 2015, it was almost three hours a day. Now, young adults check their phones an average of 20, 39 times a day, which is three hours a day. Now, that might not actually sound like a lot to some people, but when you put it over the life of a person, that's 11 full years of looking at the phone. And that puts it into perspective. So let's go back to our lemon. The power of the brain the imagination, the ability to make something seem to be present that isn't actually present. Stress is another one of our hurdles that we have to deal with in order to build habits of character. Our brain has trouble telling the difference between something that is a stress that's an actual saber-toothed tiger chasing us down to eat us, or a test, exam, a relationship, pain, a sorrow, a grief. There is, uh, the brain has difficulty separating the two out. So what happens when we get into this mode, we enter into something called fight or flight. When we don't feel that we have the resources to be able to deal with the stress that is before us, that saber-toothed tiger is chasing us down, cortisol is released into our bodies, one of the stress hormones. And with that, it gives us a burst of energy in order to outrun the tiger. But the challenge is, is that if that stress keeps going on and on and on, cortisol actually makes it harder to make long-term memories. So if we're living in that fight or flight, that stress response, day after day after day, it can be a challenge for making those long-term memories. What else happens? When we're in fight or flight, it becomes harder to pause and plan. We're just focused on our survival, this moment, so we are not going to be eaten by whatever it is that's chasing us. But it's harder to look ahead and to make plans that are long-term because those don't seem as important to our immediate survival. So one of the ways, if we find ourselves in fight or flight, and it sounds very simple, almost too simple, is to take three slow, deep breaths. What that does is it actually tells the brain it's not being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Many of the world's religious traditions focus on the breath as part of their prayer practice. And this is one of those reasons I think we're finding scientifically why that helps. So I encourage you, if you face a moment where you don't feel the resources you need to face the stressor before you, take some deep breaths in that moment. A final major challenge that we're facing in building habits of character is lack of sleep. And some of this also goes back to our use of technology and the use of our phone. We sleep to live. It is crucial that we get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. And actually the numbers are going up, maybe eight and a half to nine. Again, different people have different needs. So just understanding that the range is seven to nine hours for sleep need. 
going under six hours over a period of days is actually as bad as going without sleep completely for a couple of nights. So that's a challenge to think about. When we do not get uh, four hours, when we get four hours of sleep or less a night, our brain function drops 30%, and for two nights, it drops 60%. Five nights sleeping six nights, six hours, five nights sleeping six hours or less is the equivalent of going without sleep for two days. And this is from John Medina Brain Rules. We also know with the use of our smartphones that this, these devices interrupt our sleep cycles, often because these devices are on our nightstands. We wake up, we check the phone, we go back to sleep. We wake up, we check the phone, we go back to sleep. A cycle is created in that, and this lack of sleep then can actually enter us into that sense of a survival mode of fight or flight. We start to feel that we are under duress. So we've talked about these different ways that the brain makes memories. We've talked about how habits are formed, how things are learned. And we've learned some of the ways to care for our brains, food, water, oxygen. And we've learned four stressors or hurdles that we need to jump over in order to be able to build habits of character. So the question to you is, how are you caring for your brain? If you're wanting to build a new healthy habit, it takes time. It also takes energy. Start small where you are, not where you think you should be. And how would you incorporate this information into your life? That depends on you. That depends on your specific situations, your particular body and brain and experiences but I encourage you to think about these things and see if there is one step that you would like to make. What is the story you want to write with your life? And what is one action step you could take today with this information? When I'm in the classroom, I step into the classroom, there's a the technology I need, there's a classroom space, there's, there's different support systems for the students that they need. It makes me feel like I'm part of something that people care about. And that makes my job easier because then I don't have to worry <laughs> about all of that. I can just focus on the student and the class and the teaching and know that the rest of it is being cared for by people who love this university.